Good morning, folks. Um, I just wanted to go over some a few things from these chapters that <clears throat> I just wanted to highlight a little bit more on. Um, so we are on week six. We have two more weeks to go. Just a friendly reminder, we are not going to have a discussion board week eight. And um, there will be a couple extra credit opportunities. One, you will get an email asking you to fill out a course evaluation. You can fill out the course evaluation, um, and that would get you 10 extra credit points. The course evaluation does not show me who says what, so don't feel intimidated. We want you to answer honestly, openly. But if you so choose to do that, you don't have to, but if you choose to, I will give you 10 extra credit points. Um, also, I will, um, to replace a missing back Blackboard discussion, I will offer um, a 30-point assignment of writing a one-page summary on the discussion board that you missed um, and then submitting that to me through my email and that would replace a missing discussion board and then um, if you are able to turn in your capstone on let's see just really fast oh well let's just say uh, day two as opposed to day five um, I would give you 10 extra credit points as well I will write this in the announcements, but for those of you watching, you kind of have a head start on knowing this information. Um, it's been a pleasure doing this class with you guys. Um, I know it's a bit of a unique experience being online and not really seeing each other face to face, but hopefully, um, based on your readings and your discussion boards, you guys are learning a lot. And it's interesting just even reading um, your last assignment on on the moral dilemma, just seeing how it's challenged some of you in your thinking and just where you're at. and Maybe what we would have done in our adolescence is different, what we, what we do in our adult years. Um, it just is a lot that we get to take in being in this psychological field, and hopefully it brings a lot of self-reflection um, and self-awareness to ourselves. And I think that's what makes us better clinicians if we're able to address things that we see in ourselves. So we're talking about relationships, and it's so interesting. I think in our culture right now, um, you know, I, obviously I'm a, I'm a woman, um, and I'm all about women being treated fairly and appropriately and things of that nature. But I think sometimes there's this push um, for men and women as if we're exactly the same. Um, and for me personally, um, I don't want to be like a man. I want to be a woman and be respected for being a woman. <laughs> and I acknowledge the differences and I'm okay with the differences um, because in my opinion, we are different. I think God created us very differently for, for good reason. Um, I don't want to be a man, <laughs> um, which I'm sure a lot of men don't want to be women. We're, we're different beings. We're uh, not one of us is the same. You know, each woman is different. Each man is different. But we are different from each other. And even when it comes to relationships, um, you know, one of the things I'll say to clients sometimes is women are face to face. Men are side by side. Now, that does not mean that every man and there aren't men that like to be face to face and women that like to be side to side. But stereotypically, women can meet with each other and meet face to face, go get coffee, go have lunch, go get dinner, and they feel very satisfied from having conversation, a phone call. Um, they can talk for a long period of time, and that's how they feel bonded and close. Whereas men, they typically do things together, like they may go to a football game and watch the game and talk at the game, but it doesn't feel like they're talking because they're there watching the game. Or they might go play a pickup basketball game or go to the gym together or go do something together, play video games together. A lot of young people nowadays, they play video games on the network online and so that you can hear you you can hear people, but you're playing together. I have one minor and that's the way he keeps in touch with his friends. Um, which is, which is very unique and different. Um, but again, I think in general with relationships, like quantity, um, is not better than quality. You want quality relationships. Man and woman just be friends. Um, I think this is an ultimate question, right? Um, I think it can be very tricky. I think men and women can be friends. I think this is very different than it was in the past. I think usually it works best when there isn't any sort of sexual attraction to one another, um, when there's boundaries. Um, I think it's hard because sometimes one person becomes attracted to the other, but I think there can be ways where guys and girls can be friends and there be no 
necessarily um, misconception or misunderstanding or things of that nature and it not be complicated. A lot of men and women are friends. Um, and before where this was looked at as taboo, I don't think it's as taboo anymore um, or it looked like there was an objective behind it. Um, I think it's genuinely men and women can have close friendship relationships. I think if people are in relationships, they just have to make sure that's um, appropriate to their partners because that can cause problems in relationships. But I think overall it is possible. I think it's just being clear on expectations and boundaries. So love, there's three basic components, passion, intimacy, and commitment. So passion is the intense physiological desire. You know, some people say attraction doesn't matter. It does. Now, attraction can be very subjective to the person. Now, what may be attractive to you, to you may not be attractive to me. That doesn't mean that the person's not attractive. All that matters is the person's attracted to the person that is interested in being with the other person. Um, so it's very subjective. Intimacy, intimacy is sharing all thoughts, actions with each other. So intimacy isn't necessarily just sexual intimacy. You can have emotional intimacy. It's, a, it's being very close to another person. And, of course, commitment. Willingness to stay with each other through good and bad times. And that's a lot what we see a hard time with in our culture. It's hard to stay committed. Commitment is a, a work in process. Um, so commitment is obviously what comes later. Passion is usually very high in the beginning. And then as you get to know a person, typically it grows into a more intimate relationship and then commitment comes becomes a topic of conversation. Um, so usually these are the theory behind what brings people together. Education, physical attractiveness, religion, um, similar interests, things that you have in common. Um, you know, nowadays uh, with all these different dating websites, people are able to kind of see those things that, which make them a match. That doesn't necessarily mean they will be a match, but they see the things that will allow them to be a match. These are the things that people do at this point to like, you know, they're able to see their match and then decide if they have things, if they are who they say they are online. Now, that's always the tricky part because a lot of times people are not who they say they are. Uh, one in the five couples meet online. Um, and, you know, we have the different terminology, like, I got catfished, um, which is when someone portrays themselves as one thing, and then you show up to the date, and they totally look different. Um, you know, a person's photo might be them 10 years ago. <laughs> um, and I've seen some of these profile pictures, and you're like, seriously, that's the picture you decided to put on the internet? Um, but anyways, again, attractiveness is really subjective to the person. Um, again, very interesting how guys and girls are different as far as what they choose, what they select. Um, so that's, those are some things that I wanted to kind of address. Um, okay, so violence in relationships. Um, five million women and three million men experience partner-related physical assault or rape annually in the U.S. Ten percent and sixty-nine percent of women worldwide report being sexually abused or raped. Men are victims of relationship violence one-third the rate of women in the U.S. Um, and it happens in both gay and lesbian relationships as well. Um, I think, too, um, it's not easy for a person to come out about domestic violence or um, sexual assault in a relationship. However, um, I think women are able to do it easier than men, and men are abused in relationships. I've had many women come in and talk about how they are the more aggressive one in their relationship and their spouse is not, um, but the spouse is embarrassed to say um, how the wife treats him. Um, and, and these are real things. Um, so just something to be mindful of. I think this was made more aware, and this is, might sound silly to you, but um, one of the TV shows that was on MTV it's called 16 and Pregnant, and there was a girl on there, and she used to straight up hit her, hit her baby's father, her was her boyfriend or fiance, I think, at the time. And um, they had to put up warnings afterwards about if you're in a domestic violence relationship. And I think it just kind of brought to light, at least maybe with the younger culture, of how women can be. Um, you see this girl just beating up on this big guy, um, and he's not hitting her back. Um, I think she got sent to jail for it too, but it's just problematic. It's something that happens in 
not only adult relationships, but in relationship violence happens in younger relationships, which is for something for parents to look out for, because it is um, very a very real, very real thing. Okay, so we're going to go into a, a job satisfaction. Um, and I think job satisfaction is so important because people get a lot of respect and value from what they do. Um, now, not everyone is in a job or in a career that they feel like is their cho chosen vocation. There's a lot of great books out of there uh, uh, about job vocation. One that I can think of off the top of my head is What Color Is My Parachute? Um, it's an older book, but it has really great concepts on trying to figure out what, what you're into, what your values are, what's important to you, where you want to live, what are things you like doing. And, and this is a great way for you to kind of figure out um, some things before you make decisions about careers. Um, anyways, something to just kind of think about if that's something that you're, that you're trying to figure out for yourself or you know someone else. I think there's great assessments too, like StrengthsFinder um, is a great assessment as far as like trying to figure out what your strengths are, focusing in on those, and then choosing vocationally um, after, after learning your strengths and understanding them better. Um, okay, so people's experiences affect what they want to do. Probably a lot of things have caused um, you wanted, wanting to maybe go into a psychological field, whether that's social work, becoming an MFT, LPCC, um, psychologist. Um, you know, I think people usually, there's reasons why they want to become doctors, teachers, police officers. Um, there's usually some experience or some reason why you would like to do what you do. Um, you know, people change their careers, you know, and sometimes that can be hard. Um, you grew up saying you always wanted to do this, and then when it comes right down to it and you're at that place of doing it, it's, it's maybe a lot harder than you anticipated, or you're like, I don't really want to do this. Um, and that's okay. Um, it just depends on where you're at in life and what's going on. I apologize if you heard a little person. We're having some dilemmas with um, Mario Brothers and... Um, learning how to play video games nicely with one another. So I apologize if you just heard a little voice. They just interrupted me. Um, but um, millennials, right? Um, no offense to millennials. They're great. They have a lot of great ideas. They're very creative. Um, I think millennials have a lot of expectations of how things should be, and that isn't necessarily reality. Um, so there's maybe a lot of job changing. I think there's a lot of reality that hits once one graduates. Um, you know, once they graduate from college and then they're out in the real world and they realize, oh, I'm not going to make as much money in maybe as my parents. And that's because my parents didn't make as much money as me when they got out of college. It took time. And I think sometimes that's hard in a very much like I want it now kind of instant satisfaction, instant gratification world. Um, but again, getting experience, putting yourself out there, a lot of jobs are looking for people that have experience. So sometimes that means taking a lower paid job but you're getting the experience, or maybe you might have to work two jobs. Um, and maybe your job where you're gaining experience, you don't get paid. Um, you know, that's the journey if you're gonna become an MFT, that's the journey that you're probably gonna be on being a trainee. A lot of trainee positions, you're not paid, and that really is a bummer, however, you need those hours to graduate and so that means you might be juggling a full-time job and an extra side job so um, it is something for you guys to be aware of it is kind of a bummer but um, you get those hours and that experience and that helps you with getting hopefully a site when you're an associate um, so again mentor executive coach having someone like that's a part teacher, part sponsor, part model, part counselor who facilitates on the job learning for present and future work. Um, this kind of person would help um, help develop relationships. Um, they just develop leadership skills in other people, help the workflow, um, help the people that are underneath them feel more comfortable and confident. Women and minorities particularly benefit from having a mentor, someone that can help cultivate them, develop them. Um, a poor mentor is worse than having no mentor. So having someone that's leading you down the not the right path isn't helpful at all and is potentially more destructive than if you just were kind of swimming with your head barely above water. Um, job satisfaction, the positive feelings that result from the appraisal of one's work generally increases with age. Um, I think um, there's a book, it's called Love and Respect. Some of you may have read it, but they say 
Um, a man feels love or a man feels respected when he feels loved and a woman feel, will respect her man when she feels loved. So it's like this circle. And I think a lot of times men feel respected when they um, are feeling good about what they do. And when they're not feeling good, it makes it harder at home. Um, that's seen in a lot of relationships. You know, I think, you know, when our work is where we spend most of our time and in our culture in the U.S., like that's the truth. Um, if we really hate what we do, it's going to affect us. It's going to affect us personally, emotionally, spiritually, potentially, because um, it's really hard to separate. I think we really feel in our culture that we should love what we do, and I'm not saying you shouldn't. Um, however, uh, you know, there was a time where you just worked to make money, and you were able to kind of separate it. Like, this is what I do, but maybe I have something else that I love that I do on the side, or this is what I do to support my family, and like I'm able to leave it at work. Um, but when we feel very dissatisfied in that area, it, it creates a lot of emotional pop problems. Um, and so just something to be aware of, you know, like you could have people coming in who are really concerned about depression or anxiety, and it has a lot to do with their job, just not liking it. Now, it could be specific things that are happening at a job, and there's a lot of rights for employees, or it could just be the kind of work that they're doing and how dissatisfying it is, you know, to them personally. Um, alienation is when workers feel that what they are doing is meaningless and effortless. And so, um, you know, stuff that happens between sometimes that can, kind of environment can be created by a boss or a supervisor. Sometimes that happens when it's just not the right fit. And so it's trying to navigate that with people. Um, you know, like I said, HR should be there to support an employer um, if somebody is purposely being passive aggressive and doing something to someone. Or it could just be that the job's not a good fit and you can't connect because you really can't buy into what you're doing. Um, and, that, and that's a reality too for people. Um, but it is, I mean, I'm very fortunate. I really do enjoy what I do. I love seeing clients. I love teaching. I love supervising future therapists. I am one of the very fortunate people that does um, that does get to do something I love. And then when I'm not doing those things, I'm home with my kids. And um, yeah, that's its own kind of career field there um, <laughs> uh, that has its own problems. And I wish I had HR at times. Um, however, um, you know, I am one of those people that is very fortunate, but a lot of people don't have that, um, that ability to do something that they truly do enjoy that that does make ends meet so you know I think being really able to help people problem solve and maybe get the courage to apply for other places or figure out how they can how they can look at the a different side of the coin um, is huge in therapy and that definitely will be something that you will come across because work dis dissatisfaction causes a lot of problems burnout I don't think our culture has a good work life balance. Um, I think it's work, 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 um, and then we'll get to play later, which some of that is true. Um, you know, I think save now, play later, play now, save later, you know, that whole kind of concept. Um, you know, I, I think, though, it's trying to figure out, like, if we're commuting to work three hours, I work all day, it takes me three hours to commute back, like, when am I actually home? You know, those kinds of things are, that would create burnout in a person. Um, you're exhausted, you're tired, you can get depressed, you lose motivation. Um, you're just done. I think when you feel taken advantage of by, as an by an employer, like they just want, 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 and they're not really seeing you for what, who you are or what you need, that creates burnout. Like a lot of self-help type, or not self-help, I'm sorry, um, helping professions, public servants get burned out. It's exhausting. Um, even in the field of therapy, you can get burnout if you don't have the right allies, the right resources, the right colleagues to talk to because you're just hearing hard things all day long and it's just could be exhausting. So these are just things that I wanted to talk to you guys about to be aware of. Um, I, I hope this is a bit helpful. Um, we're almost done. We're near the end. Um, so I look forward to continue working with you all. Um, and I hope to see you in future classes or hear you in future classes. Um, anyways, um, I, we have one more week where I'll have a lecture and then I'll be week eight finishing everything up. Thank you so much. Have a good day.